So this next series is going to be a pretty short, just one video series where I show you how I recreated this architectural corbel. Now this piece actually came off of a house that is actually just right across the street. They're having some work done to it and the contractor doing the work subcontracted me to recreate eight of these. Now this, this piece came off of a colonial house. It's not a colonial revival. So um, best guess um, with the history I know of this town, this house is probably from the mid 1800s to the later 1800s was when it was built. So these did last quite a long time. And minus a few um, expansion cracks and whatnot, that was most likely due to the fact that there were quite large nails in here. Um, these are in pretty good shape, but they wanted eight redone. And this is what mine are gonna look like. So you could see they match pretty well to the original. They'll also be about two stories up. So little, little indiscrepancies you won't be able to, to notice with the naked eye. Um, in my personal opinion, the hardest part of, of recreating older wooden pieces especially is just that um, the lumber that they had back then is just not the same size of the lumber that's most commonly found in stores today. So um, playing around with, with getting the right widths and lengths can be a little bit of a challenge. Not necessarily a challenge, just longer to do. I'm also uh, making four of these. This has a, a, a plate on the bottom as well, but this video is also already kind of long, so I'm not gonna show making these, but once you see how I made these, you'll easily be able to, to, to um, figure out how to create something quite similar to that like this. So to start this project, I had to remove multiple layers of old paint. Like I said, this house is fairly old. So whenever you're working on older stuff, there's, there's multiple layers. In order to get an accurate pattern, I had to remove some of the paint, especially around the curves. You could see that the thickness is almost um, an eighth of an inch. So in order to get the most accurate pattern, that stuff had to go. And then I could get some rough measurements for sizes. I'm building this out of um, Douglas fir construction grade lumber. That's the stack I have. These originally were, I think, 10 footers that I cut down so they fit my shop better. And this stuff is an inch and a half. The piece at the end of the day is four inches wide. And what we decided to do was make it in four separate pieces so that I can make the pattern on the edges. The middle portion would be two inches wide. So all this stuff had to be cut into pieces and then planed down to an inch. That was kind of a chore just because um, the circuit in my shop isn't super powerful. So in order for my planer to not keep uh, tripping the breaker, I originally cut these down into very small pieces. So I ended up sending um, over, I believe it was 30 something pieces of lumber through the planer. But that's basically what I'm doing is I'm cutting it down to rough sizes so that I have these smaller chunks to work with. Now this lumber is, since it's from Home Depot, they sell a nicer grade of Douglas fir, and Douglas fir is a, a good rated material for exterior use, but I had it sitting in my shop for about two months before I started this project, because if you get lumber from the hardware store, the humidity level is still much higher than getting lumber from um, a, hardware so a hardwood source. So in order to cut down on planning time, I'm going through and cutting off some of the material on these pieces. This is about a quarter inch curse I'm cutting on the inside of the piece on all sides. You can see it there. I'll raise the blade. It, this blade height goes up to three inches. And then I'll just be left with a little strip of material in the middle. And that just made, it, that just made sending this through the planer a much faster process. These are, like you saw, almost 11 inches wide. So sending those through my planer, it would get bogged down pretty quickly. But now I only have to worry about trimming down. The majority of this is that little strip. The other reason I chose Douglas fir is because it's going to be painted. There was no point of making it super nice. The originals were pine and lasted quite a long time. And these are decorative corbels. They're not holding up weight or anything. So, um, they're going to be under an awning and not really subjected to the elements as much as something out in the open. These were going to get a lot of sun and or rain. I probably would have designed this a little differently. You can see right now I'm just taking these down to dimension and that dimension is an inch thick. 
just planting them on both sides. Whenever you're planting lumber, you want to make sure that you're planting, removing the same amount from both sides. And this is what my stack is starting to look like. There's a little bit of undulations on the edge, but that doesn't really matter because I planned out these cuts to, to pretty much avoid knots and, and the edges. So that is what the stack is looking like. So in order to get my first pattern, because you could see the middle portion is recessed compared to the edges, I took off that one top part and then I could trace this on there. Their edge you could see has a, an addition on the top of it. What I decided to do was to make the whole thing that thick and then route out those grooves. It will be a little sturdier than, than adding on a piece at the end. So I have to make two patterns because there's two different uh, sh size shapes for this. So I'm just using some half inch plywood. I'm going to cut out that pattern and you see I'm leaving a space on the edge. I'm going to put some cleats on the edge that will act as a fence. This whole piece will line up against that fence and I could route out the pattern. This was quite a process. It was a little bit more of a process than I thought it was going to be mainly because um, I didn't think about the fact that there were two different size dimension pieces. Honestly, this is something that's probably best suited for someone with a CNC. You could plug this in and just have it cut all day long. It wasn't necessarily a difficult process, just a little more time consuming than I was thinking it was going to be. So I'm just building up um, a one inch ledge. When I cut this pattern out, it was it was two layers thick, so I get the identical pattern on the top and the bottom. This way I can route from both sides. And then I could just slide my piece into the jig. Now I'm using this flush trim bit, which has the bearing on the top. Um, and that is just so that I don't have to bog down the router with removing a ton of material. So that is why I chose this one. I didn't have. I've gone through a couple of these. Um, if you're not careful and you you push it too far, you can you can wear out that bit pretty quick. And then I quickly realized that the half inch was too thin, so I cut another piece so that the top was now thicker, so that um, that bowl bearing. The the way I had it set up now was I could remove less lumber. So I just, I made the, the third pattern one screwing onto the top identically to how I'm cutting these out. I just put it in the pattern and cut it out. This is my piece. Like I said, there was a lot of knots in this lumber. The grade of lumber since COVID has not been spectacular, but you could see how much material is being removed and I was able to avoid just about all the knots that was, that was in this lumber. So like I said, those bits are great, but they are very easy to bog down. So in order to, to not bury the bit in the lumber, I went through before I cut each one and just removed the bulk of the excess. So because of the sections I'm cutting now, the middle sections, I just screwed through the top in order to keep this in the jig. And I'm going about halfway down routing routing this piece. That's why I had to add the thickness to the top. Um, I would have had to go down further if I didn't have that top as thick as I had it. So that's the first pass. Then I could flip it over and route the other pass. So like I said, there's eight of these and there's two intersections on each eight. So that's 16 of these I made, which means there was two outer edges. There were 16 of those as well. You can see I kind of have it lined up and the pattern looks pretty good. It matches quite well. I was pretty happy with it. So then in order to make this one, I'm going to go through it a little bit faster because most of the process is the same, minus the fact that you're cutting out that inner, inner decorative panel. But I made a jig again. So to cut, off, cut out that inner panel, you can see I have a couple drilled holes so that I could feed the uh, scroll saw blade into and I'm cutting this out with the scroll saw. I only did the decoration on one side. I was nervous doing it top and bottom that it wouldn't line up perfectly. And then I made the jig the exact same way, exact same process. The only problem with this was I wasn't able to route all the way through. So I would have had to clean up the corners on the scroll saw anyway, because the router doesn't get perfect the, into those small spaces. But that also means I had about an eighth of an inch of material to remove as well, because the router didn't go all the way through. But like I said, same process. I'm removing the bulk of this with the jigsaw. I just find the router works a little bit easier um, if you do it this way. 
with that bit. And then for this one, since this is facing out, and I could have done this on the other one as well, I screwed it in place on the edges so that you wouldn't see any screw holes in the final piece. And then I could go through and route the edges again. This time I started off with three quarter inch lumber so I didn't have to worry about uh, thickening it up. And that's, that's the, the base, basic process. The only problem with, with this, on this one especially, was you could see it happen right here. A little chip would come off, sometimes in that bottom corner. It was easy enough to glue back in place. But that was really the only problem I had with these patterns. The other problem, and this is why a CNC would be great, it's a lot of work. Not a, a ton of work, but it is a process of making these jigs. You had to make two of them. Three, considering the fact I'm making another another um, style of this for something that I'll probably never use again. So in order to start cutting out the middle, I used a smaller sh um, depth bit so I could remove a smaller amount at the beginning. So I'm just going through all of my pieces and I remove a little bit at a time. Um, to use the Freud bit, I would have to remove about a half of an inch at, a, at the first pass and that's just too much material. So I had this exact same style bit with, with um, a much thinner, thinner, thinner shank that I could go through first. So I, at this point, I'm doing all of them at once. I'm, I'm, I cut all 16 with the jigsaw, then I'm going through and doing the first pass with the, the router, and then going through and doing the second pass. So you could see the Freud bits in there to finish these up. So this was more of an assembly line making these outer edges. I didn't do one at a time. So you can see it's just going through that whole piece. And doing it this way, um, you just get a very accurate, accurate stack. You could probably, my jigsaw is not that great. It's, it's, I've definitely thrown it a couple times, so it doesn't cut super, super straight. Um, but you could probably, the outer curve, if you're really good with the jigsaw, if you had a bandsaw, that would be perfect for cutting that outer curve. That's how I probably would have done it. The router is nice because they're all perfectly identical though. So then to remove that inner material, you can see I just drilled a hole once again. There's a little bit of material left and I could just go through with the scroll saw and clean out all that, that inner, inner stuff. The scroll saw is great because you could, um, you could thread stuff in there and then that inner piece comes out and that's base. I could clean up a little bit of the corners and that's basically what it looks like. So then this is, this is my kind of assembly line I have going of pieces. So it's, like I said, the bigger sides on the edges and then two in the middle. These are the nails that came out of the original piece. So they're older style cut nails. You could usually date, date furniture by the style nails in there. These were, are pretty symmetrical. They weren't hand forged or anything like that. So that kind of dates this, like I said in the beginning of the video, to the the middle of the 1800s, especially with the architecture of the house, to the later, later, later half of the 1800s. And then to clean up the edges, because there is some undulation in the pattern and, and some bits and pieces that need to be cleaned up, I just used a, a bit on my router to go through and clean all that up, especially since now you're doing, dealing with end grain and spots. It could be a little rough, and then I could get inside as well and, and clean up all those pieces. Like I said, since this is up pretty high, you could probably get away with not doing that, but I, want, I did want these to look nice, even though they, they are going to be up pretty high. So then to glue these together, I glued together three pieces and then screwed three of them together. Um, I didn't want a lot of exterior hardware because even though these won't get a ton of rain on them, that's where stuff will fail. If you have hardware where water gets in, it rusts the hardware and then it starts to rot from the inside out. So you can see I put those screws on and then the top piece will hide those screws so water will never get to them. And then I just attach that top piece with some brads. I would have loved to have screwed the whole thing together. It would have made it super strong, but I kind of settled on all th uh, three of them being screwed together and one being bratted in place. You clamp them together and I let all of them dry. This is the quick jig I made once these were all together. I just made this on the table saw real quick, put two pieces of plywood on the edges so I could clamp it in place and then route those, those two little notches out of the front. 
So like I said, now this is all one piece. This isn't an added piece for it to fall off. These were also old enough that the originals didn't have any glue on them, and if they did, the glue wouldn't have been that great back then. Now that we have stuff like Type On 3, which is rated for exterior use, um, these will last a, a, a really long time. And then I just put a coat of shellac based primer on there. Shellac based primer is a little bit more expensive, but I love it because it hides, um, it helps with, with knots and stuff like that, leaking pine over time. It, it helps keep all of that underneath the, the, the coat of paint, but also because it has shellac in it, it dries super fast and I am ridiculously impatient. <laughs> 